How are Michael and Milan handling everything? Hi, guys. We're live. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Okay. Hello, everyone. Hi. Hello. Hi. Hi. You guys are doing well. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Um, <clears throat> we wanted to uh, do something a little bit different today. You know, we've been doing the uh, the Chaosian Laws Law Lingo for a, for a while and having uh, discussions about uh, legal topics, uh, you know, fr from all different areas. Uh, but we wanted to kind of switch things up a little bit and bring in other uh, professionals and incorporate it into what's been going on, uh, the whole COVID situation, and what's been happening in uh, in the world uh, of uh, of business and the consumers and uh, and how things have changed and how things are going to continue to change. Uh, so we wanted to get in, bring in a, a variety of different. Uh, professionals to give their take on what's going on in their world, um, you know, we in, in the in the government, you know, in the city, uh, in real estate, uh, in banking, uh, in marketing, and in law. So we wanted to bring in, you know, things that are uh, aside from not not only legal issues, but um, a, a, you know, what's going to happen when we all go back to business, and what to expect uh, in all these different uh, areas. Uh, I want to thank um, the participants. Uh, we have one person who's um, who's running a little late, but he'll be on shortly. Um, Artie Kasakian, uh, Harut Kedolian from John Hart, Michelle Klein from Clear Channel, Melkon Melkonian from our firm, Chaosian Law, and we're going to have uh, Viken Hosepian from Golden State Bank. Uh, I don't want to waste any more time, guys. I want to get into the introductions. I want to give a brief intro. Uh, about each person, uh, and then we'll get into questions and discussions, um, and uh, we'll we'll you know we're going to go back and forth on on different issues, and whoever has questions on Facebook, uh, please feel free to to send us your uh, questions to write to write your questions, and uh, we'll get to them after the program, uh, and we'll you know we'll address uh, as many as we can uh, towards the end, um, Artie. Kasakian, uh, he's the newly elected council member of uh, the city of Glendale. Congratulations, Artie. Thank you. Uh, he's been in the public service world for over 20 years. Uh, he's worked in Washington as an intern for members of Congress and for a public affairs firm. Uh, he worked for the ANCA, where he focused on policy issues related to immigrant rights, voting rights, genocide awareness and prevention, and other issues on the local, state, and federal levels of government. In 2005, Artie ran for the open Glendale City clerk seat uh, when, uh, with the explicit goal of making elections in Glendale more transparent, accessible, and secure. The voters of Glendale overwhelmingly voted for him over eight other candidates, making him the youngest person ever uh, elected to a Glendale municipal post in the city's history. As Glendale City Clerk, Artie worked for almost 15 years focusing on issues of governance, including the use of technology, improved transparency, uh, increased civic engagement, accountability, and building greater trust in our democratic system of government. Now, as a city councilman, he continues to fight for these issues, including uh, opposing overdevelopment, fighting crime, protecting the neighborhoods, improving transportation and traffic planning, demanding more affordable housing, promoting the arts and building more parks and open spaces for families. Uh, now with all the issues surrounding COVID, his priorities for all of the above are even more important. Uh, congratulations on winning at this time and, and, and getting into the, the council during these trying times. Uh, you have your work cut out for you. Thank you, Howard, and thanks for hosting this and putting information out there that uh, the people watching this and people who are at home um, can use. Right. Uh, Harut Kedolian uh, is the president and CEO of John Hart Real Estate. Uh, Harut established John Hart in 2009 during one of the most challenging times in real estate. Uh, John Hart is a real estate full service uh, firm headquartered in Los Angeles. Uh, and led by a team of industry experts. Um, it's established with the sole purpose of redefining real estate, and that's their logo, Real Estate Redefined, as you can see behind him. Uh, the firm has grown 
to 10 offices, over 300 agents and 70 staff. Uh, all of Harut's agents and staff will attest to his unbelievable and unwavering work ethic, dedication and support, which has led them to be one of the most preeminent brokerages in the real estate world. Uh, I, I can attest to that. I know um, my actually my broker's license is with John Hart. And I know I get Harut's emails at 4 or 5 a.m. in the morning, um, inspirational uh, quotes, um, do this, do that. And, and you know, uh, I, I think we opened our offices pretty much the same time in 09. And uh, during the worst possible economic uh, times, for, at least in our lifetime, and, and I think, uh, you know, congratulations on where you've uh, taken John Hart. Uh, and it's truly, uh, truly amazing. Uh, talk about ground up. I mean, 10 offices and 300, eight, but, you know, he's got almost 400 people working for him. Um, welcome and, and thank you for, uh, thank you for uh, agreeing to be on. Arut, uh, thank you. Thank you very, very much for putting this together. Um, I don't know, uh, uh, I'm hoping that uh, we're able to give you as much value as, as you've given us, man. You're, you're an incredible man, and, and we all are, are honored uh, to be here. I, I can speak uh, for myself as, as well as everybody else on this panel that, uh, and say that thank you very much for putting this together, not only for us, but for everybody that's watching as well. Definitely. Thank you, brother. Uh, next, we have uh, Viken Hofs, Dr. Viken Hofsepian. He hasn't joined yet. He, he has some, he's having some issues. Uh, technical issues, but he'll be on soon. Um, Vikan earned his BA from UCLA. He then went on and earned his uh, master's and PhD in US foreign policy formulation and international political economy. Uh, he's been in the banking world for almost 25 years. In 2013, he was part of a team of new management and shareholders who joined Golden State Bank, which is headquartered in Glendale, California. He currently serves as a member of the bank's advisory board. Uh, and since 2013, him and his new team that came in have taken Golden State Bank's assets uh, from uh, $80 million to just under $400 million. So we're going to be here from him uh, about banking issues and, and different concerns that the people have uh, post pre and post COVID. Um, so we'll welcome him when, when, he's, uh, when he connects. Uh, next, uh, Michelle Klein. Um, Michelle is welcome, Michelle. Thank you. Michelle is you. Michelle is currently a regional marketing leader at Clear Channel Outdoor, where she develops and implements marketing strategies for businesses. Since the year of 2000, she's been in the marketing world, working for many reputable companies as product development coordinator, corporate marketing coordinator, management manager of sales marketing and branding. She worked for ESPN for six years as their West Coast manager for advertising sales and marketing. And uh, she, she does a phenomenal job with getting uh, businesses uh, out there and getting them noticed and getting them, uh, getting them to bring in business. Uh, Michelle, thank you for accepting our invite and, and joining us because I think it's very important, at least for our uh, viewers who own businesses to, to be able to see from someone like you what it's going to take to to get their customers back uh, after you know everything is opened up and 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 what strategies we should be using to to do that so uh, welcome and um, thank you for joining us thank you thank you for hosting this and I'm really looking forward to talking about how we get back to business thank you uh, Melkon Melkonian. Uh, Melcon's been a partner at our firm, Chaosian Law, since 2014, where he specializes currently in personal injury and real property matters, including property damage and land use. Uh, he's been involved with, with the firm since its inception in 2009. We actually uh, opened the firm together. He was the administ administrative director of the firm uh, and uh, obviously one of its founders before becoming an attorney. Uh, prior to working in the legal industry, Melcon was involved in the public sector, uh, including working for the city of LA, managing city projects and handling constituent relations in the second council district. And he also worked for the state of California's Department of Justice as a contract analyst. Um, in the private sector, Melcon worked as a land use consultant and handled residential and commercial property management and development. Uh, welcome Melcon, thank you for again for, for joining us. Um, 
uh, obviously we're uh, we're part of the same firm. So uh, thanks again for for being here. Um, hey, Carlo, glad to be here and uh, and really looking forward to this. Uh, guys, I, I want to let everyone know that this, even though I, I've been speaking for a, a couple minutes, few minutes now, introducing everyone, uh, this the, what I, what I just told you guys is a very short glimpse of uh, the resumes of everyone on this panel. Uh, if I were to read everything that each one of these people have done, um, you know, it's it's it, it, all, all we would be talking about is is background. So um, I, I want to get straight to um, giving the opportunity to everyone uh, to talk. Let's talk about what's going on. Um, Artie, I want to start with you. Uh, I think uh, a lot of people are going to have questions about the, the city in general and Glendale City. And also, uh, I'm sure there's associations with the city of L.A., uh, what's uh, tell us a little bit about what's going on? What's the current status of the city? Uh, are you guys fully operating? How um, how you're operating and, and and what's going on? So since the declaration of an emergency and the pandemic, um, pretty much everything has been placed on hold. If you were to visit City Hall today, um, you would find that virtually two thirds of our staff are not um, on premises. Everyone is either uh, working from home or coming in on a rotating basis. Um, the only things that are continuing um, as normal are our emergency services, our police and fire. Um, obviously, trash pickup, um, our integrated waste, um, that is continuing as planned. But a number of things have changed and been placed um, on hold for the time being. For instance, uh, we are not giving tickets to anyone who's parking on the streets on days when there's no parking because the city has told people you have to stay at home. Um, businesses have been shuttered, although some have slowly started coming back and I'm sure we'll get into that. Um, and for the most part, uh, we're just like everyone else trying to see when we're flattening that curve that everyone has spoken about. One advantage we have in Glendale is we have three hospitals and we have a healthcare industry that's very robust. So. Currently, we are the third highest total number uh, for um, coronavirus COVID cases in the county um, behind Los Angeles City and uh, Long Beach and Pasadena, actually, I think is getting up there as well. But when you adjust for age and there's this age adjustment model, Glendale happens to have a much older population. We have more seniors. We have a lot of skilled nursing facilities, which are taking the brunt of this um, coronavirus um, pandemic, um, this infection. Our numbers actually tend to drop and we're in the middle of the pack. We're fairly average, but because we have an older population, we have a population that's at risk. Um, of the 70 plus deaths that we've had in our community, most of them have been people who are above the age of 70. Um, and most of them, I would say about 80%, if not more, have come from these skilled nursing facilities. So we continue to monitor the situation. Obviously the health and safety of our community is most important. And that's what we're focused on. And then after that, it's about getting back to normal. Right. And, and I know that, um, uh, you know, Glendale's population has tremendously increased over the years. Uh, and, and I'm sure that's been a factor. I know all the, the developments that have been going up and, and, and the people who have been moving into Glendale. I mean, Glendale's become an amazing city. Um, you know, it's become, you know, a mini, mini downtown with, uh, with all the developments and the Americana and all that. So um, I, I, it kind of makes sense that the numbers might be a little bit high just because of the, the density issue there. Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, you know, I think you guys obviously have your uh, work cut out for you over there, but hopefully, hopefully we're on the tail end of things of, of this situation and we can all get, um, get back to normal. Well, normal, whatever that normal is. Yeah. <laughs> very soon. Um, Artie, what's, I want to ask you, what's, what's the relationship with the, uh, with the city of uh, LA? I mean, are you guys coordinating with them or are, are things? Uh, you we know, are absolutely. I'll tell you, there's uh, three entities um, who we're following very closely to determine our own policies. First and foremost, it's the state of California. Uh, we're looking for direction from the governor um, and from his team to see what is happening statewide and what they're uh, laying forth in terms of how we can uh, return back to normal. I'm sure some of your um, viewers and in the audience and our panelists have been also following the various phases that have been outlined. In addition to the state though, uh, we are located in the most populous county in probably the United States, Los Angeles County, 
is very, very um, large. It's comprised of 88 cities. We're only the third largest city in that number, third or fourth, depending on who you ask. Santa uh, Clarita has, is right there with us. Um, so the county has its own Department of Health, and we're working very closely with our supervisor, with Catherine Barger's office, as well as um, the rest of the county um, emergency operations team to understand what guidelines they're setting forth. Much of the time, people will think that certain guidelines, there's very few things that Glendale has done on its own. Um, most of the time we're looking at what the county's doing, what the state is doing. And obviously you mentioned city of LA, absolutely. Um, I think uh, for whatever else anyone may say about the city of Los Angeles during this particular crisis, I think they've had some very, very good leadership and have taken some measures and steps. And it's evident both in Mayor Garcetti's actions and others that when you look at LA's numbers, we're nowhere near what happened in New York. Um, I can't imagine what it must be like to be in New York um, under those circumstances. Here in LA, I think we got ahead of the curve and obviously Glendale seeing what city of LA was doing um, took our cue on a lot of things from them. And then some things we did before LA did. So Glendale required everyone to wear a mask when leaving their homes. Um, by some of our residents, it, was, it seemed like somewhat of an overreach. Um, I begrudgingly voted for it because I didn't think that there was a need to wear a mask if you're outside your home and there's no one around and you're just walking around on the street. But given many of the unknowns uh, with this uh, virus um, and the fact that we have an older population, we, had, we could have individuals who are immunocompromised, we don't know clearly how it's passed on, we voted for that. And so we had that for about two weeks and then city of LA also adopted an ordinance or passed a law that said you have to wear a mask whenever you're outside your home. So between these three entities and some of our other neighboring cities, we try to be in sync with one another. Um, there isn't much difference in, in the rules or the laws that we're passing. Uh, and most importantly, I think all of us collectively are looking for when our numbers start going down to a point where we can go into the last phase of the four phases and return things to normal. Right. I think, you know, the, the, the unprecedented times and the, the issues that were going on, I mean, nobody really knew mask, no mask, go out, don't go out. Uh, you know, it, it was a mess three months ago, but I think, you know, what they say, hindsight's twenty twenty. So, you know, over the last three months, we've seen the, the numbers and, and I think changes are, are finally being made uh, to kind of loosen things up. So hopefully uh, that happens uh, <laughs> very quick. I think things were opening up today. Uh, you know, they started opening up um, yeah. today and, and hopefully that's that's the, the way we go. I want to segue really quick to Harut actually. Um, Harut, you have two offices in Glendale um, and uh, what's how has it been like operating uh, just uh, as a business in Glendale? I mean, we'll get into the real estate issues, but just operating as, as a business, as an essential business, which you guys are, are uh, in, in the city of Glendale. How's that been? Well, we've taken certain measures uh, to stay safe. Obviously, uh, at the beginning of this entire thing, we made a commitment to all of our employees. Uh, we said that we didn't want to lay a single person off, and, and, and I'm proud to say that we didn't lay, lay anyone off. Uh, but we did, uh, we did want to, to provide uh, a safe place for people to, to, come, uh, to come and work. And, you know, at the, at the beginning, we, we did get some resistance uh, from... Uh, the local residents. We had some police officers show up uh, to our offices, uh, telling us that we're not allowed to stay open. And then, obviously, we had to we had to show them that uh, we are we are an essential business. Uh, but it's been it's been a challenge because obviously we're very customer centric. Uh, we we you know our entire focus is making sure that uh, our agents and, and our clients get exactly uh, what they're paying for. Uh, so we've had to close the doors to anyone that's walking in. Uh, we have allowed a single customer uh, to walk into our offices these last two and a half, three months. So it's been a challenge, uh, but uh, I'm, I'm proud to say that um, that we've that we've made it. Uh, you know, we've done a pretty good job with uh, with with staying safe. Uh, you know, thank God we don't have a single person uh, that uh, from within our circle that uh, that, that got sick. Um, Everyone, I believe, uh, is very proud to say that they they came to work every single day uh, and and made a difference. And we, we stayed positive through this whole entire thing. And 
from the very beginning, uh, Harut, uh, I want, that's, the, that's the sentiment that I wanted to make sure that everybody truly understood. It's just, you know, the, we can't allow uh, the negativity uh, that this pandemic has, has presented uh, to really get us, uh, to get us down. And we needed to stay above water. And, and, and obviously, uh, you know, whether it's a pandemic like this or a crisis uh, that we've experienced many times in the past, we need to make sure that we show up every single day and ensure our community that we are here and, and we are going to do whatever it takes uh, to, to stay in business. And that's, that's basically it. I, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that everyone is, is taking that approach and that way we can, you know, uh, get everyone back to work and, and back to business and back to, um, you know, uh, th this has been a disaster for everybody. So, uh, Artie, what's, um, what's going on in terms of, um, you know, what's the biggest problem that you guys are seeing um, as a result of, uh, as a result of the, the COVID situation? Uh, and obviously, obviously, aside from the positives, but as far as in general in the city, um, but I, th I think the biggest problem Hart touched upon a little bit as well in terms of people keeping um, their mood and their spirits up and not being overcome by this. Um, certainly, I mean, I'll tell you firsthand that I know people, um, one individual removed, I don't know anyone directly yet who's been, um, who's succumbed to this disease, but I know two people who are related to people who are close to me who have passed away. Um, and so it is very difficult to, to, it's easy to get pulled by the polarity of either side because it has become incredibly politicized. You know, people are using this as an opportunity to impose other viewpoints. And, you know, to try and remain rational, calm, to know how to read news. Unfortunately, we live in a very interesting period in news consumption. And there's a lot of media consumption today. Um, I'm sure Michelle will probably have uh, opinions as this as well, but being online, you're, you're, you create these echo chambers where you surround yourself only with like-minded people. And, and that's particularly dangerous when it comes to um, politics and a situation like this. So we're reading about how just wearing a mask has become a political statement in some parts of the country and right. trying to get people to understand that ultimately, we all at one point, even going as far back as kindergarten, learned about proper hygiene and how to keep ourselves healthy, you know, how to wash our hands, how to not touch uh, surfaces that have high amounts of contact and getting that message out to people and getting them to, to understand that. Um, on the other hand, the arbitrariness of some of these rules and regulations I've spoken out about on Facebook and other platforms, which was when certain businesses were allowed to open, I, you know, question the logic of allowing like a Walmart or a Target to remain open for uh, selling, you know, essentials. Um, you know, Target sells food and has a pharmacy, true, but it also sells clothing and shoes. And people, when they go and shop in there, they're not just buying the food, they're touching and buying everything. So it's a high risk area, right? But the store that only sells clothing and shoes was forced to shutter and um, not have a source of income for weeks on end. Um, and the arbitrariness of that um, was a little bit puzzling. I think we're finally now seeing some more um, thoughtful approach as to how to restart the economy, um, how, to, how to do all the things we are accustomed to doing, but keep them safe. And one other indication of that is graduations. I'll tell you, it was very frustrating to wait for some clear direction as to what's gonna happen with our graduates a lot of schools and a lot of parents and even administrators and teachers wanted to do something special for our seniors who virtually had their senior year stolen from them because of this virus and this pandemic. So the option was to have these um, car parades that some people were doing you know, for birthdays or others, but to have them at the schools to recognize these students. And the county at first said, no, you can't do it um, because there's this risk of infection. But at the same time, they were also passing out meals every day to students who needed meals. All the schools were passing out school meals to those individuals who qualified for the program. And so there's this you know, disconnect of logic as to why one was allowed, one wasn't. And finally, um, in the last week, um, the County Board of Supervisors and the Board of Education and others have given out guidelines and told local jurisdictions that you can have these drive-by graduation ceremonies. So I think it's taking some time, it's, it is unprecedented. I think the word unprecedented is gonna be the word of the day during this interview and throughout this whole crisis. 
we're trying to figure this out. Um, and you know, as a, a local leader or local elected official, my job is to ask the right questions so we can arrive at the right answers or the answers that work for at least um, our community. Right. Thank you, uh, Artie. Uh, Michelle, I want to jump to you real quick uh, before I um, get into a few other questions for, for Harut. Um, you know, I know, I know marketing uh, in and of itself is a very uh, a, a unique business. It's a, it's a difficult business. It's something where, um, you know, you have to, um, it's, it's like an art, you know, it's like you're, uh, uh, you know, along the lines of, uh, um, you know, actors and producers, and you just got to produce something where, um, you know, it's catchy for the business. And, and you know, I, it's very difficult. And now, especially during these times when most of these businesses were closed, um, you know, it, now they're going to come back and they're going to open and, and, and what are we going to do? I mean, what, what's the, what are these businesses going to do to uh, get stuff going? I mean, it's not going to be, okay, now we're open, everyone come back. Right. Um, I think it's going to take some, a, a lot of effort. So what, what have you, uh, what have you seen in terms of, uh, in terms of the, in the, in the marketing world as to what's going on and, and um, uh, how you've been impacted with, with all this? Well, I think that what we're seeing is people are looking to be adaptive and also be able to be nimble and, and quickly respond to the changes that are happening. We saw new changes come down from LA County yesterday. And so we're reaching out to those clients and prospective clients to try to get them up on billboards so that they can get their message out there. Clients want to are, you know, there's a lot of pent up demand. So they want the moment their business is able to open to be able to message about that. And what does that look like? So uh, we are focused very much so on what's going on right now and how do we get our clients, our clients' messages out there. We have a lot of restaurants that advertise with us across all of uh, um, our markets, especially here in Southern California, and they're just waiting for that go-ahead here in LA County. And we also have some restaurants that have some places in Orange County. We know Orange County is open for dining. So we're working with them on trying to figure out how do they get those messages out around their locations, as well as how do they amplify those messages within the mobile space. So I think what's happening with marketing is that we're seeing this shift from a long game and focusing on the big picture to what's happening right now and how do I reinvigorate my purchase funnel and my consumer funnel so that I can start getting business back. Right. And they, they have to act now. They have to act quick. I mean, I think, you know, most of these businesses who have been not operating for, uh, for at least three months now, uh, they, they don't have time for a long-term plan. Like you said, they gotta, they need it now. So uh, you, you really have your work cut out for you as well. Uh, like everyone on, the, on this panel, and, and um, you know, I, I think um, it's, it's a tough job and, and you know, you guys, you guys are, you guys are going to do just fine. Everything's going to be fine. I believe in that. I think, uh, I think we have a, a, um, a, a city, a state, a, a country filled with uh, very um, talented people and very, um, you know, smart people who, who are going to make things um, happen. And I, I don't want to say back to normal because that's uh, it's such a cliche back to normal. Uh, you know, who says that that was normal, you know, Let, let's be better than how it was before. So uh, it's going to take some time. Let's just, let's just not go back to the way it was. Let's, let's go to, um, to, to better times than it was. So um, yeah, it's, it's, it's crazy. Um, Mel, Melcon, I want to also address a little bit about um, the, the law end of it. I mean, obviously we're, um, you know, we're seeing a lot of, um, issues uh, in our, you know, obviously we're, um, we're, like I said, we're in the same firm, obviously, but, and, and, you know, the courts are closed and the, you know, the insurance companies are, uh, you know, in, in, the, in that area, in the civil area, uh, the insurance companies are, some are using this as a excuse to, to delay things and some are using them to, as an excuse to get things done quicker. So what's been happening in, in the, in the legal world um, uh, as a result of this? Sure, sure, Haru. Thank you. So one of the um, things that we've been monitoring since the beginning of COVID-19 and since the stay-at-home orders were issued is what's going to happen with our legal system. Um, our entire justice system is built upon our due process, our courts, uh, the clerks at the courts, our judicial officers. 
so whether it's civil matters or criminal matters, family matters, they all end up at the court in, in the court system, the judicial judicial system. And this shutdown uh, forced a huge, caused a huge backlog in all of these cases. And as and now as we try to start to reopen in counties across the country, um, they need to prioritize cases. They need to figure out what cases are going to go first, what cases are going to go later down the line, and how to reschedule everything on the court's docket, on the court's calendar. And businesses are impacted uh, by this uh, very significantly. Everything from um, contract matters that you may have to deal with, uh, issues whether you have with your tenants or landlords, um, issues that you may have with neighbors, um, just legal matters, just in general, everything now has taken a back seat. And the one thing I can tell you is we, we have to be patient and we have to recognize that certain matters may take priority. Um, the one good thing that the courts did um, it was that they treated this period of, of the shutdown as the freeze on statute of limitations, for example. Um, any deadlines that you, you thought you, illegal deadlines or hearings or um, uh, dates that you felt that you had to abide by or it uh, was compulsory for you to abide by those dates uh, have all been frozen and pushed out. So. Um, rest assured that you have not lost any rights. You know, businesses have not lost any rights during these times. Um, everyone is, this, is in the same boat, if that can give people some, some solace and comfort. Um, and as courts get back on to, into working mode, we will see things get back into place. However, the backlog the, is going to take some time to clear up. And um, uh, for example, in Los Angeles County, the June 15 is, is the first date that... Uh, County clerks or court clerks are allowed to get back into the courtrooms and they are scheduling to have hearings again starting on June 22nd. Uh, LA County is one of the busiest court systems in the country and it's going to be trying for everyone involved. Uh, we are going to see a shift in the way courts handle um, hearings going towards uh, virtual hearings. We, we already had uh, the telephonic system. Now we're gonna see uh, Zoom or WebEx hearings and uh, now we're gonna see things being done remotely as opposed to showing up in court. Um, Orange County, similar situation. Orange County made a decision to only handle their backlog of criminal cases first. They made a decision to have uh, civil judges handle their backlog of criminal cases because there's a due process issue there. So the one thing I can say is just have patience. Things will get worked out and uh, you know, our firm continues to work. We're working with our opposing counsels. We're working with our clients and explaining their rights and options during these times. Right. Didn't, didn't we already have a, a backlog uh, before this entire <laughs> pandemic started? <laughs> yeah, we. <laughs> now you have a, more, a bigger backlog. <laughs> yeah, already, and, I have a. I, I have something. Maybe you can you can help out with 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 this. You know, we've got millions and millions of people because I feel like. We're going to go back to, sorry, uh, Haru, I know you don't want me to use, uh, you know, going back to normal, but pretty soon, you know, people are going to go back to work, hopefully. Uh, but there's, a, there's going to be still, you know, millions of people that are unemployed. Um, so, and, 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 you know, you're only as good as, as your weakest employee, right? And, and if you can uh, give some of these people that are out of work jobs to help out with, uh, with the backlog, whether it's a legal system or anything else, I think... I think it'll, I think we'll make a lot more, uh, you know, instead of collecting unemployment, sitting at home and collecting unemployment, maybe, maybe open up more jobs. Uh, so we don't have uh, such a backlog with, the, with our legal system or anything else that's going to have a backlog when we go back to work. Right. If I could, sorry, Howard, if I could expand on this really quickly, Howard, what you said is, is very important. And I think th this aspect of it touches upon uh, what you said, what Michelle said earlier, I think businesses and the way they adapt to all of this is one of those um, shifting moments in, in, in our history. Um, and that adaptability will allow certain businesses to thrive and survive and others, unfortunately, to shut down. The courts are going to have to adapt to our current situation. And what we're going to see, I think, is uh, this type of crisis also breeds innovation, um, breeds uh, a certain type of uh, the use of technology uh, has been tremendously advanced and it is going to help. Yes, it, we have a we had a huge backlog, but maybe this will force us into applying more efficient systems to get rid of those those backlogs. Yeah.
I think these are good points. Um, you know, you asked a question about the unemployment. First of all, I think that I just read an article that uh, in Politico about how there's going to be um, a bump up if things return start to normal. And in many states they have. Nationally, we're going to see um, uh, uptick in both jobs and in the economy that's in the shape of a reverse check mark. So we took a deep dive, but we're immediately going to see a bump back up because the situation right now isn't like the Great Recession or even the Great Depression, which had much deeper, deeper institutional um, problems. What we've faced is more of a natural disaster type uh, pause in the economy. And in natural disasters, whether you know it's in the Gulf Coast or after an earthquake or Katrina, you do see the economy as you see it in New Orleans today having uh, bounced back um, with a significant bump off afterwards. Part of this, let's keep in mind, is also somewhat of our own making, which is frustrating for me because, you know, we have essentially uh, told people that you can't go to work, you have to stay home. These are government imposed rules, albeit for everyone's safety, but they have these ripple effects, right? Um, and a lot of industries are related. So there is this concern as to what's going to happen in Southern California, for instance, we have a major hospitality econ uh, based economy, especially in Glendale with restaurants and others. And um, I think the fear that's been and concern that has been bred into all of us over the last three months is going to make it very hard for people to want to go out as soon as this is over and have a family meal on an outdoor restaurant, at least until we know there's some sort of cure um, or some sort of vaccine, there's a vaccine against this virus. Um, it's going to create a whole bunch of other industries. I know a lot of people who've gone into the PPE uh, market right now with uh, personal protective gear as well as disinfectant and proper cleaning. I think that's going to become standard practice. And the other, I think, impact that we're going to have is I think it's shown everyone, including evidence by what we're doing right now, that it's not the end of the world if some people decide to telecommute and work from home. There's significant disadvantages, but it's shown us that it's doable. So maybe there's going to be a different kind of work-life balance that emerges from this. Let me just say that in Glendale, one of the things that we've done, and one of the things I spoke about before during my campaign was this over-reliance on the retail uh, sector as a source of revenue for the city. Um, you know, we have the Americana in Glendale, we have the Glendale Gallery, we have the Brand Boulevard of Cars, and the sales tax generated from all of those has helped uh, build the city of Glendale into what it is. But the traditional model of retail is was before all of this already dying. Um, more, a lot of car manufacturers were going to a subscription model where you would pay a monthly fee and you could come and get a new car just as you do with a cell phone, and, and that was emerging onto the market. Um, you know, people are buying things more and more online, and and more so now um, after this crisis. So, what's that going to do to the brick and mortar stores? Um, and we have to figure out, you know, how do we grapple with tax revenues or how do we get tax revenues to do the things that cities are expected to do within their communities in the absence of that local uh, sales tax generation? Or how do we gen gen generate other taxes? In right. Glendale, we have a tech sector that we're focusing on now. That's going to be one area. But I think the answer is slowly emerging. And maybe this will bring, as Malcolm said, some things faster to the forefront than before. Right. Um, I totally understand. Uh, you both meet uh, Melcon and, and already brought up two, two issues, which are going to take me to uh, Nicole. Uh, Nicole, sorry, Michelle. Um, I'm mixing up so many people you speak to during the day, you mix up the names. Um, it, it's funny, Michelle. Earlier, we have a Nicole here, and I called her Michelle. Uh, <laughs> so, um, Michelle, um, Melcon mentioned technology. And already uh, mentioned uh, a change uh, in, in the way things are being sold, uh, going gearing towards uh, online. And, and I think uh, uh, Harut as well. I'm going to come to you right after Michelle, but uh, in, the, in the real estate uh, world. But Michelle, in general for business, uh, what are we looking at uh, technology-wise? Um, what, what's going to be the new? What's going to be the new thing? I, I know. I know you. You and I have. Uh, we've discussed several. Uh, uh, things that have been going on in different programs that you guys have, but what, what's, what can businesses do now uh, to, 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 um, you know, to, to get on board with all these new uh, issues that we're facing? 
So, I mean, I think we're, we're looking at two things. One is how do we get back to normal business and how do we get revenue generating in the way that it was and, and the way that you said, even better than where we were before this started. And the response is that you have to be really scrappy, right? Because we don't have the same consumer base that we had before. So we're gonna have to diversify in a way that we didn't. I know, for example, here at Clear Channel, we're working really hard to diversify the categories that we go after in terms of prospecting. So entertainment is king. This is the Los Angeles market. I know in San Diego, which is also our market, we have a lot of casinos. Those two verticals have been hit really hard by what's going on. Casinos are starting to open, but obviously not in the way that they were before. So we're starting to think about what are the other categories and actually the government is helping and leading the way in that because when they open a new what they consider to be essential business, that's where we start to put our focus. We're also seeing that there are certain categories that are thriving right now in this business home improvement has seen hockey stick like growth because people are home and they're focusing more on their homes. And so it's giving them that extra opportunity to improve what's going on. Um, so there are categories that are thriving and that, you know, as already mentioned, there are categories that are going to emerge as a result of this. We're already seeing it now. I'm having other businesses reach out to us to try and buy their products, whether it's those, you know, perspective, the, the sliders in between the cubicles to try and create a socially distanced work environment or a hand sanitizer. P new people are making masks. They're having to diversify the products that they create so that they can continue to generate revenue. So it really is all about that being scrappy and being nimble. And then when we're talking about technology, I mean, now is the time to sharpen the saw, right? So if you have an opportunity to innovate the way that you're delivering to your customer, this is the time to focus on it. So we've seen it, you know, the grocery stores and the, the restaurants are doing a really great job of delivering on demand to their consumers. So for those people that don't want to leave their homes, and we have also seen an increase in the amount of data. So we as marketers and uh, as marketers for our clients who are also marketers, we are looking at data, lean into the data and follow the path because that is gonna help you develop the strategy now. The data that we're seeing is showing us that people are going out more than they were before. We're starting to see a steady incline and in exposure to our out of home boards. And that really means an incline in an increase in business for our customers. You know, one of the things I'll add to that heart is that um, right as these stay at home orders were being issued, I think not too uh, long before that Disney plus launched. Now Disneyland is obviously or Disney is going to take a hit in terms of its theme parks and its attendance and it's going to be a huge revenue loss. But I'll tell you just as a person who's uh, sheltered at home with my family. Um, we jumped on that Disney Plus bandwagon right away, and I'm sure many other families did the same. So if they come out of this with less subscribers than they projected, then they must have done something wrong with their marketing. Um, so there's going to be a lot of opportunities. And if you were a business that didn't have a website before or a way to order online before coming, after, coming out after this nationally, um, it's certainly going to be something that you're going to try to uh, hone up. 100%. I mean, we've seen that there, people are spending 53% of their time on their devices, so their laptops, their cell phones. And so now is the time to take advantage of that technology and that digital to message out to your consumers and to your potential clients. Right. Um, you know, I, I was, um, uh, Harut, no, Harut and I are, are, are um, I guess it's the name, uh, where uh, we, we like quotes a lot. And uh, and I was reading um, different quotes uh, uh, earlier today, and you know uh, the 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 employees and, and the business owners and, and the business world. Um, I, I found this uh, very fitting for for them. It, it said, um, "When the world says give up, hope whispers try it one more time." So I think um, you know I, I think everyone, all the business owners and all the the employees, um, you know, need to need to understand that that this is a, a big problem uh it's it's not a problem that can't be fixed uh it's not a problem that can't be overcome 
and, and I think everyone um, can do it. They will do it. Uh, like I said, I'm very confident in our uh, in, in our in our uh, you know city, state, uh, country that that everything is gonna is gonna be great very soon, um, and and that's just gonna be uh, just because of you know the 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 history of this country won't allow anything otherwise, um, and and you know we just have to like you guys had mentioned just innovate you know we got to think of new ways and, and new uh, approaches and um, uh, and better approaches you know earlier Melcon said uh, you know we're going to be doing court court systems or or you know we have the the, the phone system now but we're going to go into video uh, and whatnot hopefully uh, you know uh, for our for our industry imagine uh, we're in we're based in Encino uh, if we have a hearing in downtown or Long Beach at 8 30 in the morning uh, whatever whichever attorney is going to appear has to get up at 6 30 and hit the road by like you know, hit the road by 637 to get there on time. And most of the time, it's like a 15 minute hearing. Um, it just, it's not an efficient use of time. So I think, um, uh, you know, kind of looking at the, uh, there, there is no silver lining, but it's going to force us to, to innovate and to, to do um, things differently. Um, are, you, are you saying that you're no longer going to charge the drive time from your house to the court? Right. You know, you know how big of a deal that is. I mean, in our, in our industry, yeah, you know, yeah. insurance <laughs> on, on, the, on the plaintiff side, we don't charge for that, but on the other side uh, for businesses and hourly work, uh, that's a big deal. I mean, back and forth, that's three hours of, uh, of billing, which you can just kind of X out. Uh, so it's going to save everyone a lot of money. Uh, how do I want to come to you? Um, and, and I, and I know one of the biggest topics now uh, or, or always is, is real estate. Um, I, I want to, th there's this big discussion and, and I hear from different people uh, and, and in, in different conversations with different groups of people, you know, some, some who are in the industry, industry, some who are not, that are, um, you know, the market's going to fall, it's going to be, uh, it's going to be bad, it's going to be this, it's going to be that. And, and I, I personally don't think that's going to happen. But I want you to talk about how this is different uh, than the 08, 09 uh, crisis, real estate crisis we had, where that was more of a, a, a banking issue where, you know, everyone was kind of overextended and, and no equity and whatnot, and, and led to a lot of foreclosures, whereas this is not, is not, is nobody's fault. And, and I think a lot, a lot of people have more, uh, a lot more equity in their homes. So I don't think we're going to face that kind of a situation. So uh, explain, uh, you know, what your take is on, on 08, 09, 2010 uh, versus, uh, 2020 and, and 2021 and 2022. Yeah. Um, so as you mentioned, right, when you were introducing me, uh, we actually started uh, the, the company in, 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 the, in the real estate crisis and we called it the Great Recession back then. And, and people want to compare what we're going through right now to what we went through in 2008, 2009, 2010. And, and, and we always joke about this when we say, you know, all you needed to do was, was fog a mirror and you, would, you, you, know, you were qualified for a million dollar loan back in 2008. Uh, and in the last, you know, seven, six, seven years, the restrictions on, on, on lending have been just, uh, it's always almost been impossible. So it's been, uh, we've been lending very responsibly. So everyone who owns property right now sits on, on a ton of equity, like you mentioned. So there, even if there is any type of, of, of turn in the real estate market, I think people are going to fight tooth and nail uh, to, to, really, to really hold on to their properties and do whatever it takes in order for them to, uh, to, to, to make sure their mortgage payments are made and, and make sure their equity um, is, is being, and they're being responsible with their property. Look, we're hearing it a lot right now, and we're hearing a lot of propaganda. And I think media is creating. I remember uh, when this whole thing, thing started, CNN came out and said, oh, "We're going to have a housing crash uh, of 20 or 30 percent, uh, a decline within the next, within the first couple of few weeks." One of the things that people didn't realize is uh, that people just don't want to sell. Right? There is a there's a huge issue right now with inventory and whenever there's an Im issue with inventory uh, and you've got rates uh, right, right below 3% right now, uh, you're not going to have the kind of crisis and the kind of crash that people are, are predicting 
that there will be. We're, we're, we're you know, every single day and, and you hear it from me daily, we've got, a, we've got a problem right now in the real estate in, in market and that's lack of inventory. We don't have enough property to sell, but we've got buyers just waiting in line and every single time, you know, we have, we have a listing to put on the market, which means that we're going to see not only are we not going to see uh, the, the market you know, the take uh, to, the, to the downside, but I believe in the coming couple of few months, we're going to see prices start going back up again. That's my fear. My fear isn't uh, property values going down. My fear is we're going to start seeing uh, property values uh, go up uh, and 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 not stop for a while. So that's what we're that's what we're grappling with right now. That's the those are the issues that we're we're trying to resolve. And and as much as we can, we're trying to go out there and and educate our, the consumer on exactly what these next uh, couple few years are going to look like. Uh, and as long as interest rates are as low as they are and money's free, how do we're not seeing any type of uh, of issue with the real estate market at all whatsoever. It doesn't compare, uh, you know, people have too much equity, too much to lose uh, right now. It has absolutely, uh, you know, I, I compare this to what happened in 2001, not what happened in 2009. This is not uh, a real estate crisis. Uh, like you said, you mentioned earlier, this is a national disaster uh, that will be here for the next, hopefully, you know, six to 12 months, and, and we're, going to, we're going to recover from it as soon as the vaccine comes out. And, and again, as long as the Fed's doing what they're doing, uh, the, our bond rate is below, below one, you're not going to see a real estate crash. Uh, Harut, uh, I know uh, I see a lot of your agents who are, um, you know, who are doing um, different, uh, uh, different things, uh, obviously, because of the whole um, you know, social distancing and, and all that stuff. Uh, I know a lot of them have been doing, um, you know, a video um, uh, showings, you know, showings via, um, you know, Facebook or whatever, Zoom or whatever the case is. Uh, what's the, you know, in terms of technology, what's the real estate world uh, world seeing now differently? Well, Todd, I'll tell you, we've been very, very fortunate. And from the very beginning, we kind of predicted uh what was going to happen uh and, and we've already been uh, we were already a firm that uh was technology first uh, you know we don't consider ourselves a real estate company we consider ourselves you know a technology and media company uh so we had the advantage i can't say the same for for all the other firms out there but we uh, here uh, were very focused uh on video we were very focused on social media since the beginning of uh, of even you know social uh, so we've been very fortunate to just pivot slightly. Um, and I think, to be honest, we're as a real estate firm, and, and there's a lot of obviously um, you know, differences of opinion, but I think we're better today than we were three months ago, simply because we've learned uh, how to communicate better uh, with our audience, um, our virtual open houses. For example, I'm doing another Zoom training like this tomorrow morning at 930 I'm sure you received the email uh, that basically covers all the do's and don'ts of virtual open houses, virtual, virtual tours, how to engage with your clients, how to get more clients. And I think the firms that are, that are taking this and using this to their advantage are going to see a lot of, uh, a lot of them gain a lot of market share because uh, we're able to reach a lot more people than just putting out signs and asking a couple of few people to, to, to show up to your open house we're able to reach hundreds of people every single time we go to a listing and we hold it open uh, as long as we're doing what it takes to, to let our audience know that we are going to hope you holding these, these, home, these homes virtually. Look, everyone loves real estate, right? Everyone wants to know what's out there, uh, whether it's the neighbor who's curious about the value of the home that just got listed or, or someone who's dreaming about the, the day that they're going to own a home themselves, they wanna see what's, what's being shown. And as long as you get how to communicate in this market, you're going to be just fine. As a real estate firm, um, I, I get to see my agents and my staff a lot more now than I've ever seen them. I feel like I see them at least once a week, all 300 uh, or 400, uh, where before 
I would have to drive to wherever you know my locations were, are to, to just see and touch and feel uh, the people that want to want to hear what I have to say. Now it's just any opportunity I get, uh, we just you know put together a meeting. Three minutes later, bam! You know, I just put together a meeting this morning, and tomorrow I have 100 people plus that are going to tune in just to hear what we have to say about virtual open houses and how to do better, right? right. So you just you just gotta you just gotta do whatever it takes. I, I you know I'm a big believer in that. I think Melcon will attest to it. Uh, you know, we, we've been uh, ever since the social media, uh, we, we've we've jumped on it from day one. Uh, you know, there was a back back in the day, you know, uh, it was kind of like taboo, you know, law firm and, and social media. Come on. What do you mean? You're going to have a, a, a Facebook page and Instagram page. Uh, you know, when, when that was uh, that was going on, we, we were all over it. And, and I think um, it, it's it's the greatest thing that that we did back in the day. And, um, you know, it's just. Uh, Michelle, I'm going to come to you because transition to you in that regard, because um, are we, you know, my, my question is, um, are we done with TV and radio? Are, are we, are, are we, is that it? I mean, are, are you know, are these TV commercials and, and radio commercials, um, are we, are we shying away from it now? Is it all, um, well, not all, but is it, is it tech? Is it social media? Is it iPhone? Uh, you know, whatever, um, uh, pop-up ads or whatever the case is that is that what we're where we're going um i think a lot of people want to think so but i don't know that that's where we're at i want to go back to something that harut said that i think is really key right now to messaging to clients and consumers and that's that education is key right if you're in an industry like the travel industry which is working really hard to get people back on planes and into hotels it's all about educating that you're in a safe environment that people feel comfortable coming back to you as a loyal consumer, a loyal traveler. And there are other industries that are experiencing the same thing. When we're talking about TV and radio, you know, I have a soft spot for TV because that's where I started my media career. And I still feel really strongly about the largest screen in the room, right? So you can basically watch any content on any screen. So I think TV is still important. But what TV looks like now is very different than what it did when we all first started tuning in. So uh, a lot of it is streaming content. I know uh, um, for myself, I'm a cord cutter. I know a lot of people that are cord cutters. We don't have cable TV anymore. Everything is through streaming rights. And I know that people expected that as this was happening, that TV was going to get a lion's share of what was happening with advertising. And that hasn't really been the case because there are, there are so many options out there and there's so many places to put your advertising. And it's also, in some ways, it's skippable, right? I don't remember how often I actually see a commercial when I'm watching content because I pay in order to be able to skip through it. So, you know, going back to that conversation about technology and digital, it's really important. Yes, TV still has eyeballs and yes, people are still engaging with that screen, but you need to diversify. You need to be on multiple media and in multiple channels. So if you're not, if you're only advertising on TV or you're only advertising in digital, you're putting all of your advertising eggs in one basket and that does not push people down the funnel. It's really important that you speak to your consumer at the right place at the right time. But changes and habits and consumption habits of media change all the time. Yes, people are watching a lot less TV than they used to. And, you know, when it comes to radio, uh, you know, I want to ask you, when was the last time you listened to radio in your car? Yeah. Well, you're right. I mean, it's, it's, you're, you're listening to it, or, or most of the people are on the, the Spotify or whatever, uh, whatever the case is. Um, yeah. But uh, yeah, you're right. I mean, it, it's, it's interesting. Um, but, you know, you and I have had this discussion before the, the multiple, um, uh, uh, avenues that you have to take you can't like you said you can't just um you know stick to one and uh and expect to get results i mean you gotta you know what i, I think in my opinion from what i've seen over the the last 11 years is you know you you have a thousand dollars to invest you don't invest that in one place you gotta spread it amongst two minimum two three places uh i think that's just the way it works and i think that's what the businesses have to you, you, you definitely have to find your sweet spot. And, and I think for radio, it goes back to your question about technology. So radio is still going to exist, but in what form? And I think that 
you know, folks like at iHeartRadio and the other places that exist in what we're now calling the audio world, they're just finding more technological advances in order to deliver that content to audiences so that they are still relevant, right? right. So radio still exists, it just exists in a different format. Right. Uh, Mel, I, I wanna go to you real quick. Um, and I want to open it up to some questions after you're you're done with this. But uh, what's what what are what are you seeing um, in the legal industry in terms of um, you know increases? Uh, I know we've been dealing with a lot of the the business loss claims, the business income claims, uh, bankruptcy inquiries. Uh, talk a little bit about those uh, areas that that are um, you know that have been increasing. Um, in, in terms of uh, client uh, questions. Right. So the, what's going on right now is, is, is as people have been staying at home, the people's concerns and issues and legal issues have really kind of shifted. Um, the f financial security of companies and financial security of individuals is definitely at the forefront of their, of their mind. Um, people are wondering if I get back to business, even if I open my doors, the, the length of time that it's going to take people to get customers, um, is, is that going to be uh, short enough of a time for them to remain in business, become sustainable, and become profitable again? And the, the calls that we're getting is, well, how first of all, a lot of people have business interruption insurance through their commercial policies. Uh, however, many of those policies, almost all of those policies, have something called virus or bacteria exclusion. So that means you you although you've been paying for this premium for many years, and although uh, if you had, for example, a fire or a flood in your business, you would have recovered that money. Now the insurance company is telling you, well, no, we have, you know, buried within your policy is this virus exclusion. So therefore, we're, you know, we're not liable and we're not, we're not going to extend coverage and we're not going to pay. So the business now is saying, all right, um, I qualified, maybe I qualified for some money from the SBA, uh, maybe I got a loan from the SBA. Maybe I got a, a what's called the PPP, the Paycheck Protection Program, but that's only for two and a half months. What do I do now? If my insurance company is not going to pay me um, for my lost income and my overhead is the same, how do I survive? And those are the types of questions we're getting. Um, uh, on, one of the things that we've done, we've, we've been getting a lot of these insurance questions. We've gone hundreds of these policies and we're dissecting them. We're going to, through them line by line to see if there is some way to get coverage extended. And I think there is, there is a legal argument to be made and um, that's what we've been busy with. Um, I would like to tell business owners everywhere, look, um, the reset button in our financial system is the bankruptcy. Um, it's not something to be embarrassed of. It's not something to, to be scared of. It's definitely a, a gut check, but it, it exists in our legal system because it's our, our, our le uh, framers and our, our legislatures have anticipated that, that being necessary. So um, if that's something your business needs to do, it, then that may be a viable option. However, don't just do it yet. Um, a lot of Haru talked about it. Michelle talked about it. Um, the idea of um, revisiting your uh, aim plan, the idea of seeing how you operate it as a business and business, your business model. Don't be afraid to make some changes and adapt to the current economic climate. Now is the time. If there was a time, if there was ever a time to make changes, it's now. Because what's the worst that could happen? You're already not making money. You've already been shut for a few months. Nothing to be afraid of. Right. Do what you need to do and become adapt adoptable. Right. Adapt and um, as far as what we're seeing, like I said, business claims is one thing, bankruptcy is another, and people's, um, a lot, also we're getting calls about people's obligations and contracts and leases, um, you know, uh, because everybody's been in the same boat, essentially, this isn't just a local issue or, you know, or, or a natural disaster to confine to one location, it's worldwide. Many of your counterparts, meaning if you're a business owner who has, um, you know, a shipping company that ships your items and, you know, you have an issue with the contract, they're in the same boat. So I'm seeing a lot of businesses cooperating and creating ways to, to help each other and remain in business together. So don't be afraid to reach out and, and talk that out. Uh, and that's what we're telling, that's what we're telling our clients. Really quick question, Mel, someone just wrote, um, can, uh, can rental property owners, investment property owners use uh, the loss of uh, rent 
um, make loss of rent claims as part of their loss of business income. Uh, is that possible? Really quick. Absolutely. That is definitely possible because it's, it's written in the, in your policy, but again, it goes that back to that exclusion and, um, you know, don't be afraid to reach out to your attorney to reach out to us. I will review your policies and let you know exactly where you stand with that, but it is something that you can claim. Um, and, uh, it is something that you could stand to recover for. Uh, Artie, there's a question for you. Um, someone's asking, uh, they heard that the, uh, restaurants, uh, that are going to open eventually, uh, they're going to be operating at 25 uh, to 30 percent capacity. Uh, how, you know, the question is, uh, how, how are they going to be able to to survive? And, and if that, if, first of all, is that the case? And if so, how are they going to be able to survive with that limited um, uh, exposure, just 25 to 30 percent of their uh, capacity? Well, um it's it's a very difficult question to answer because uh, the reality of it is I don't know how many of the businesses, especially in the restaurant businesses where margins are so small and um, it's very competitive, how how a lot of these uh, restaurants will survive. I mean, first of all, first and foremost, um, we have programs or not programs officially, but movements have started like Takeout Tuesday and support your local restaurant. In Glendale specifically, one of the things that I've proposed that city council look into is um, capping the fees that are charged or the percentage that is charged by some of the delivery services um, for at least the duration of this pandemic um, and this crisis. Uh, because uh, a lot of the companies, whether I don't want to go uh, down the list and name them, we've all used them to have um, food delivered to us. Uh, some of them charge up to 30 to 35 percent to restaurants of the whole total sale. Um, and if you're giving a third of your profit away to another company, which the delivery person who's taking the food to its customer is not even the key beneficiary of that. They're getting paid somewhere roughly around minimum wage. Um, it is not a sustainable model, um, particularly as the supply chains are still somewhat in question. I know restaurants that I've spoken to that have told me that the cost, the price of meat has gone up uh, significantly. And I don't, let me just be clear, I don't mind if during uh, the what normal econ economic circumstances, these companies are charging 30 or 50%. As a restaurant owner, you uh, make that decision yourself to enter into that agreement for the benefit of your own business. But I think during a time of crisis like this where everyone has to tighten their belts, um, do their share, um, participate in helping their neighbor um, and uh, each other, uh, I think that these companies can still operate while charging a, at least a modicum uh, of a fee to the restaurants that have to rely on them. Their hands are tied. We've told them that they can't operate in their normal model. So many have a responsibly and out of necessity turned to the delivery and pickup model. Um, and now some other uh, enterprises taking advantage of that of some of these restaurants. And I think that we need to at least put a cap on it for the time being. So Glendale City Council is gonna consider that. Hopefully that'll help some of the restaurants. Um, and afterwards, uh, we're gonna to have to see. I think that there's these talks of opening up public spaces and allowing them more of the street space and sidewalks for outdoor dining. I don't know how realistic that's going to be. I think it's gonna take a lot more for people to kind of overcome their concerns. And let me just say, in addition to the restaurants, um, I'm also very concerned for the banquet halls. Banquet halls are a huge business that has, like restaurants, but maybe more so, a ripple effect. You know, in Glendale, where we have a number of banquet facilities um, for various occasions and where in various communities and ethnic communities, the uh, celebrations of certain important um, uh, touchstones and, and life uh, points is, is critical uh, to celebrating in large groups. You know, you have photographers who are out of business now. Uh, you have uh, flower florists. Um, the catering companies are in the same boat as, as these banquet halls. We have to figure out a way to bring all of these folks back in a safe way. Um, and that is still being determined. Right. Uh, we're looking at, I don't like the, the solution that I saw online where people were sitting in a cafe with these like swimming pool noodles on their heads to maintain social distancing. I don't think that's realistic. But I think if we can put in some guidelines that say, look, um, 
you know, tables need to be this far apart. You need to check maybe temperatures. I mean, let's keep in mind that there are some countries that have already shown us the model to returning to business as normal. South Korea is one of them. Um, obviously in China, there's been some return to normalcy if we can believe the figures coming out of that country. And I think we have to look to them as models. Right. Um, thanks, Artie. Uh, Harut and Melko, and I have the same question that was, was typed um, to, to both of you. Uh, are you guys doing virtual uh, consultations? Uh, Mel, really quick. Yeah, absolutely. We've seen a, a necessity uh, coming forward. So uh, we've been uh, meeting with clients virtually. We've been consulting virtually. Um, and it's, you know, the telephone has always been there. So, you know, we've been consulting over the phone for a very long time, but this whole new virtual um, system helps to see somebody face to face and really connect with them on a different level. So we've been doing that and it's uh, been working great. Harut? Um, well, yeah, so this is something that, that we've been very excited about since the very beginning, but I want to go back to what, what Melton was saying earlier and, and touch on what Artie just said, and then I'll, and I'll tell you a couple of things that we've been trying to do to help the community and, and really help these, these businesses do better. Uh, but, I, but I also want us to, to make sure that we're very careful not to allow uh, businesses just to make an excuse and use the pandemic as an excuse not to move forward, right? And, and, I've, and I've been seeing that a lot and that frightens me more than anything else does because we are, we, we have become, uh, and I, I, might, I might get a couple of jabs because of this, but we have become a kind of, kind of, the kind of country where every single time there's an issue, we're looking to see who's going to save us, right? And, and this is something that I need everybody just you know, whoever I, whoever I talk to, I, I try to get them to understand that not everything, you know, not everyone is going to save you. Sometimes you just got to fight for yourself and save yourself. And, and going back to what Artie was talking about, as far as, you know, some of these restaurants go banquet halls, absolutely 100%. There is absolutely no, uh, no way around that. But some of these restaurants, instead of relying on the Postmates or the DoorDashes or whatever, you know, take this as an opportunity for you to develop your own delivery system, for you to innovate, for you to go out there because everybody's at home right now and people are sick and tired of cooking. I know, you know, for us, you know, Friday nights, the kids look very much look forward to sushi night and every single Friday night, you know, there's this restaurant that we love where we, I go pick up food from and, and they've turned their entire restaurant into, into basically takeout and, and, and they're, either A, delivering themselves or B, you know, figuring out easier ways of how to, uh, how to get their product out into uh, the hands of the people that want it. Uh, so I just, wanna, I just wanna make sure that we just, you know, stop sending that message of, you know, we need to help them. Sometimes people have got to step up and, and help themselves and really figure out ways because the more we try to help, right? The more the government tries to help, the more free money is given to people. Uh, and say, you know, it's forgiven if you do this or do that, and you don't, there's loans here and there. The more we do that, the less uh, likely we're going to get people, business owners, to really think of how to save themselves because they're always relying on, 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 business, on, on the government to save them. Now, going back to what we were talking about and the question that came up as far as virtual meetings go, absolutely. Uh, not only are we doing our virtual training sessions, but every single agent at John Hart. Uh, understands the importance of doing their consultations virtually. I think that we're not, you know, most of our uh, consultations moving forward will be done virtually. I don't even think that we'll go back to, you know, meeting a homeowner or a buyer for the first time face to face. I think the first thing, the first reaction we're going to have when somebody wants to meet us and we're going to be able to meet a lot more people if we do it out of the comfort of, of our own homes. And you know, if, if we get that appointment and that second appointment, maybe we can go to their homes. But initially, you know, we're excited about the opportunity to meet with these people and meet with a lot more people. Uh, we've recently um, put together the opportunity for our agents to add, uh, we call them the I Trust Them page, where we add on uh, certain business owners to their websites. Uh, you know, the, our, our agents are, are encouraged to have at least 30 businesses that they trust, that they want to help, that they want to see thrive out of this pandemic on their website. 
And this week, as well as next week, every single one of our agents are, are encouraged to do these Zoom meetings uh, where they introduce the people that they trust. And what that does is it, it allows these 30 people to actually meet each other, right? And what we're trying to get these, these, these agents to, our agents to understand is being a connector and communicating properly uh, with, with the people that you trust and have them trust each other is really going to uh, allow your people to thrive, uh, whether it's in this market or any other market. So my suggestion is don't look for handouts, don't look for ways of how the government can save you or how you can get a loan uh, just to get by. Figure out ways of, uh, of how, to, how to do better uh, and offer a better product and at the end of the day, you're obligated as a business owner, as an entrepreneur uh, to, to innovate and, and offer a much better experience uh, getting out of this thing than when you got into it. Michelle, I want to transition to you based on what, what um, was said. And there's actually a question, um, which is, which is uh, well, you're going to have your work cut out for you. That's for sure. Because uh, <laughs> Uh, it seems like uh, everyone's going to need innovation, and I think everyone's going to turn to, um, you know, you or, or, or marketing um, professionals like you to come up with different ideas. Uh, I know um, Harut's got a different, um, uh, you know, uh, mindset of, of things, and he comes up with a lot of um, a lot of different things. But the majority of people, the majority of businesses, are going to need some kind of assistance. Uh, with that, as, as, you know, as, in terms of, uh, you know, giving them help as to how, how to change things around and what to do and what not to do. Um, so I'm going to let you touch on that. But there was one question that someone asked. Um, I, I think this is a, a, I guess, a simpler question. It says, do you think that most companies that are advertising on billboards will s switch to digital um, versus still? And I don't know what the ratio is of digital versus still nowadays, but maybe you can touch up on that and then uh, discuss the, uh, you know, what you guys are going to be doing. Absolutely. So I can tell you for us here for Clear Channel in America, the ratio is 30% digital to 70% static. We have here in Los Angeles, the largest digital out of home footprint. And we also, as a company, have the largest national footprint for a digital out of home. And it's a really important resource for the community. I know how talks about talking to your community and, and uh, further cementing your relationship. And that's really an important part of what's happening now with marketers in that just cementing the fact that you are there for them and also thanking the community. So less so talking about your brand and your brand attributes, but focusing more on an empathetic message and how you are there to help the people that are have been helping you as a business. And then um, going back to your question about what are we going to do in terms of innovation? For us, innovation relies in our data platform. So as things started to happen, uh, what people are buying when they're buying a billboard is they're looking, they're buying an audience. So they're not buying a piece of real estate. They're trying to buy the people that are going to pass by that billboard who are going to be exposed to it and who are going to engage with it as a result. And so we have a platform called Radar View, which is a, which allows us to see what audiences are passing by our boards based on mobile location data. We all have mobile devices. Most of us don't go anywhere without them. And so those mobile devices give us a lot of information about our audiences. So we're able to create profiles of boards. And what we were able to do as the pandemic was happening is create what we call COVID-19 specific audiences to understand how habits and behaviors have changed in the face of the pandemic and who is actually seeing the boards. So what we are seeing, and this is starting to evolve as more businesses are opening up, is we are seeing people are staying closer to their home. So they're staying within closer proximity. How do we target those people? Because they still have a need for goods. So our audiences allow brands to tap into targeting those consumers, targeting uh, consumers within the platform so that they can make sure that they're creating a really effective marketing campaign. So those audiences can be what we're calling lapsed consumers of people that used to go to gyms. There's lots of opportunities out there 
for at-home fitness and applications. And we're giving those brands an opportunity to do that because we know who used to go to a gym and who's not able to do that anymore. We're looking at people who used to go to restaurants. So you guys talk a lot about restaurants needing to revive their business and what are they going to do? They're at 25, 30, 50% capacity. Well, one way of doing that is make sure you're targeting people that have been to your restaurant before who are, are casual diners. If you're a casual dining restaurant or fine diners and making sure you're driving that message in a really targeted and effective way. So uh, I think that innovation comes from knowledge and information. And so we are being really uh, responsive in the way that we're looking at the data so that we can provide that back to our consumers so that they're not focusing on 60, 90 days, but what the, can they do now to reach those consumers? And then the question about, are we seeing a shift to more digital? Yes, right now, as we talk about, you know, now new categories are opening up. So people can go into places of worship. In certain counties, you can go into a hair salon. Well, if you're in that community, you want people to know that your hair salon is open, but you also want them to know that you've created a safe environment for them to do it. Digital is the best way to do that. It's responsive. We can get you up in 15 seconds. So static is still important and it's important for maintaining that message and for people who don't want to share, but digital is really crucial right now as we're looking to be super quick and responsive in the way that we're getting messages out. Right. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Michelle. Uh, Harut, there's a question to you. I, I, I want to, um, you know, I want this to be uh, maybe the last question and then I want to do a brief uh, sum up. We've been on for about close to about an hour and a half. Um, but before I ask you the question, I want commitment from all of you guys that uh, down the road, we're going to maybe do more of a one-on-one -on -one, um, because this one was more of a general, um, uh, general, you know, informative uh, session. I think if we're, if we're one-on-one, -on -one, I think we can get a lot more uh, detailed into things and, you know, we don't want to go on for, for hours and hours. So, um, I, you know, I, I want you guys to commit to uh, future uh, sessions for us and um, we'll, we'll, we'll get into further details about uh, your specific area. Uh, Harut, um, first of all, commit, please. <laughs> <laughs> commit. Um, okay, yeah, Harut, the question. You know you, know, you, you know you always got me. I know, brother, thank you. Uh, the question is, uh, Harut, do you think the luxury real estate market might take a little bit of a hit uh, as a result of this? I don't think it's going to take a hit as far as prices go. Uh, I think we'll hold steady, uh, but I don't think you're going to see a lot of sales in the luxury market simply because there is um, no money to be lent right now. Uh, there is brokers are, are, are basically tied, their hands are tied. There's absolutely zero dollars that are, that are being, run. I, I, we own a, we own a, a lending company and we can't uh, lend anything over a million dollars. Uh, so the big banks are the only ones that are giving out any kind of uh, loans, whether it's, you know, Wells Fargo, Bank of America, and we all know how difficult to chase, uh, how difficult it is to, to, to do any kind of business uh, with them. So I think that you'll see a big dip as far as sales go, uh, but I don't see, um, I don't see a real, uh, real downturn in, in, in as far as as far as the prices go. I don't. Really don't. I really don't. Okay, guys, uh, thank you. Uh, what I want to do now is I want a, a quick uh, cap. You know, one minute, two minute uh, discussion as to what you know. What what what's your recommendation? What's your uh, you know? What do you tell your your consumer, your constituent, your 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 client? Um, you know, when when they call you now. Um, you know, let, you know, I want it, I want it to be where, you know, people are, are, are hopeful. I, I don't, you know, this is not, this is not a time where, um, you know, when, when someone's down, you know, you, you, you know, drag them further down. No, we have to, we have to, um, be positive. Uh, I'm, I'm very, you know, we're, we're very positive uh, at our firm. I know Hadoud's positive. I, I know Michelle's positive. I know, uh, Artie's I mean, Artie, talk about getting in the council at the 
at an interesting time. Um, so I want to start with you. Uh, you know, let let you know what do you what do you say to your constituents? What do you say to to, to everyone? I mean, not just your constituent. You know, you're you're a, a public. Uh, you know, you're a, an elected official. Uh, you're a government official. What do you you know What do you tell the people uh, in um, at this time? You know, um, I mean, this is a time for a lot of introspection um, and reflection and figuring out, you know, the time that we've had to ourselves has helped many of us try and better understand or allow us to better understand who we really are and what drives us. Um, and I'll be the first to admit, you know, um, as positive as I try to be, there are days when um, just the circumstances have made me feel a little down. Um, but uh, on the flip side of that, you see um, very um, heartfelt and uh, wonderful gestures by people helping each other out. Um, it's inspired me to also uh, take steps to do the same with my neighbors. I mean, you know, as, as a public official, you have to keep that stiff upper lip, but I only say this so that if there's anyone out there who is feeling down um, during these circumstances, to not feel alone or to feel like they're the only one. I mean, this has been a roller coaster these last um, three months, uh, emotionally, psychologically, and certainly economically, it'll continue to be as some businesses do better and others worry about their survival. Um, I, when I took my oath of office, I took it right here sitting from where I am right now speaking to you. It was very unique and I think unprecedented circumstances and the likes of which we will not see for some time. And at that time, you know, I quoted uh, the prayer that President John F. Kennedy had on his desk. He said, you know, God, your sea is so vast and my boat is so small. It's the Britain fisherman's uh, prayer. And, and I think of that even now, as I think of the vast unknown that this pandemic still has uh, for us. It is certainly a force of nature. It's been something that we did not ask for, uh, but we're faced with now. Um, and yet, you know, we're in this boat, albeit small, in a small community in Glendale, part of a larger county and even larger state. And when you look at the totality of our country, Glendale seems rather somewhat insignificant in what's happening nationally. But you look at who is in the boat with you, you look at people like yourself, the hard workers of your firm like Mel, um, you see people like Harut who in Glendale are, you know, carving out their uh, place in, in the business world and Michelle, who's, um, you know, working to make sure that, um, you know, the people know uh, what they're interested in and, and uh, where to find it in terms of advertising. And I look at my neighbors and there's no one I'd rather be in the circumstances I'm in right now with other than these folks. Um, the people in California are very innovative, very driven. We have a very entrepreneurial spirit in Glendale. And I do believe that we're going to come out of this stronger. And like I said before, the bounce will surprise a lot of people because um, through circumstances like this, people find a way um, and they're going to come out of this um, with greater vigor and hunger um, to do bigger and better things. And Glendale is no exception. I have always believed in Glendale. Um, I, I believe that we have a great, great community here driven by um, a spirit of entrepreneurship, of this immigrant can-do attitude um, with 60% of our residents having been born somewhere outside of the United States, actually more than that now. Um, and I think we're gonna do just fine. But there are concerns and let me just cap off with that. So if I can make a pitch to the viewers here, you know, we have, the, this is a US census here. And as Californians, we certainly pay more taxes than what we receive back from the federal government. In fact, we subsidize a lot of the states in our United States. Um, and part of the way we make sure that we get our fair share is by making sure that we're counted. Um, congressional districts and local uh, districts are all reapportioned and boundaries are drawn based on the fact that uh, of population, how many people are living in your state. So if you're watching this and you haven't filled out your U.S. Census yet, you have no excuse. Go online. It's very easy to do. And in addition to that, I will just say that, you know, make sure that you stay up to date with information from accurate sources, not just your uncle on Facebook or that aunt that always posts the pictures of cats and the occasional inflammatory political post. Go to the CDC website. Um, listen to experts, go to the city's website, glendaleca.gov. We have a dashboard that shows you how many new cases of coronavirus we've had. And the most important thing is wash your hands, wash your hands, wash your hands, wear a mask, stay healthy. And thank you very much for this. 
Thank you, Artie. Thank you very much. You know, they, the, along the lines of that quote, they say, uh, smooth, smooth seas never uh, created a, an experienced sailor. So um, this is just going to make everybody, uh, uh, everybody stronger. So uh, thank you, Artie. Thank you for, uh, for joining us. Uh, Mel, uh, I want to go to you two minutes, please give us a, a rundown of, of what you, uh, what do you tell the, uh, what, what, what do you tell your clients in this, in these trying times? Absolutely. I, I don't want to repeat myself too much, but one of the things that I keep saying is these circumstances uh, have put everybody in the same boat, like Artie said. So um, look at it as such and don't be afraid to, to make decisions now that you wouldn't have made three, four months ago. Because honestly, now is the time to adapt, revisit your working model and make the changes that you need to do to take your business to the next level. Law offices are no different than any other um, industry when it comes down to running a business. Uh, Haruk and I have had many conversations about our business and how we want to innovate to better serve our clients. And the reason we did this whole thing, and it, and it was um, Haruk kept pushing us in the firm saying, hey, we got to do something like this is because we wanted to let people know, like, look, there are a lot of people out there um, and um, that, that are like-minded and need the proper guidance, the proper advice. And that's what we wanted to do. Um, we need to get innovative. We need to get um, more uh, to adapt to our situation in order to provide the services, the legal services we need to do. The legal community and the legal industry will have to adapt to the current climate and make adjustments as such. And I guarantee you that is happening and that will continue to happen. Um, the last thing I'm going to say is this is this is the lawyer and me talking just because I, you know, be responsible. Be responsible as you open your business. Listen to the guidelines. Know exactly what rules and regulations you have to follow as you open. Don't open yourself up to liability. Uh, call your government officials, call attorneys, ask for advice, and don't fall in pitfalls um, in, 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 our, in, you know, in, in a country like ours where everybody's very, sometimes get very uh, litigious you want to be careful to protect your business as you reopen and as you do the different things that all these wonderful people have talked about. So um, don't be afraid to make changes, be responsible and have faith. We're all going to come out of this uh, stronger and better. Thank, thank you, Mel. Thank you. I, I, I agree with that sentiment. Uh, when, when in doubt, ask, uh, you know, you have to, you have to inquire, you have to ask, um, you know, uh, you know, you call your attorney, you call your accountant, you call your whatever you want to call they're, they're not going to, they're not going to charge you for these simple questions. Uh, you know, when in doubt, ask, uh, it, it's, it's, it's great advice. Um, uh, Michelle coming to you, um, tell us, what do you, uh, what do you tell your, uh, the business world when it comes to, uh, to marketing and, and what to, you know, what to expect and what to do, uh, and, and how, you know, what's your, uh, what's your advice? Well, first off, uh, we at 13 are feeling really positive about what's happening and the shift that we're starting to see. And we feel really strongly about what's going to happen. I think we've all learned some really great lessons about ourselves and our business and how to evolve and how to adapt. I think we've all done a really great job of learning how to work from home, but also staying focused on the business. And uh, what we've seen and what we know, especially from looking at past experiences, is that it's important to maintain that relationship with your clients and with your consumers and, uh, um, and to not go dark. So for those people who choose not to message during this time, not to continue that relationship with their consumer, they have a bigger hole to climb out of during this period of time. And uh, they've lost a little bit of brand equity and brand loyalty. So it's important that you maintain that message through all channels that you're advertising in and that you use this as an opportunity to further create those relationships with your clients through empathy, through messaging through the community. And then also really important to think about how do I do my business differently and do it smarter? Because we've talked about the fact that we've all learned from this experience and we are at Clear Channel are being uh, way more grassroots in the way that we look at our business because we have to, we've had to adapt. So focus on your goals, figure out what your needs are and then use that to guide you as you're figuring out how you're gonna adapt your business. Every business is capable of staying afloat. So how does that, what does that look like? And 
how can you do that in a way that is productive and also safe? And then um, what I'll say is that we, uh, we are feeling really good about what's going on and, and just stay positive. Keep a positive mindset. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you very much for joining us. And uh, we appreciate your, uh, your time, everyone's time. Uh, Harut, I'm going to come to you to uh, um, as, as in last and, and for you to, you know, give your, uh, give your last words uh, of, of uh, advice and, and uh, uh, you know, hope and, 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 you know, whatever you need to tell your, uh, not, not only your, not only the agents, not only people in the real estate world, but in general, uh, to the consumer and to the homeowner, to the business owner, to the to the property owner, to, to an, anyone who, uh, you know, in the, in the real estate world. Well, what can I say that hasn't already been said? Uh, Michelle, Melkon, Harut, Artie, you guys, you guys are amazing. Uh, Harut, thank you very much for, for putting this together. I hope everyone that's watching um, or is going to watch this uh, gets a little bit of uh, a little bit of something from each and every single one of us. Um, I think the common the common theme here is is adapt, right? And and we've been we've been the advice uh, across across the all, all the guests here um, has been to, to adapt. But I want to I want to basically uh, give uh, you know, suggest that people really look at themselves uh, and see what they can do uh, to help with with the people that I can't just can't figure out a way out of this, right? Uh, and there's a lot of that right now. And already, you know, said it and said it earlier, uh, there's a lot of people that are just, you know, they're just suffering right now and they can't get, they can't get it out, out of their own way. And they're trying to predict what's going to happen, what's going to happen in the next month, what's going to happen in three months, what's going to happen in a year from now. Uh, and, and they're gonna, they're gonna drive themselves crazy. Uh, the, if you're gonna try to predict what's going to happen uh, in the future, you're you're gonna you're gonna go insane trying to do that. And the, one of the things that that we're trying to do here, and and I, one of the uh, one of the suggestions that I constantly am trying to give is don't try to predict, but prepare, right? Um, and, and do all the things that are necessary in order for you to to thrive. But the only way you're going to is if you help as many people along the way as possible. And <clears throat> and one of the things that I keep telling uh, people over and over again is, is try to educate as much as you can. Uh, try, to, try to be that source uh, that people come to uh, when they have questions, whether it's, a, it's about your industry, whether it's, whether it's about the way they feel, uh, try to become that person that everyone comes to in the community, right? Uh, everybody knows Artie, uh, you know, he's someone who's, who's constantly with people, around people, uh, when he ran for uh, for council, I'm like, this is going to be a joke. He's, <laughs> he's, I don't even think he needs to spend a single dollar. The entire the entire community is in love with him, and that's not that doesn't come, uh, you know, that comes naturally to him. That's something that that he's out there. He's always out. He's always going from one birthday party to the other birthday party, the other the other event or whatever, and that's what uh, is necessary. Uh, right now to really to really get out of this is not just to innovate and we always are talking about innovate 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 but try to, to try to be hyper local try to try to go direct to the consumer and and call every single person that you know and try to say what do you need what is it that you need help with what can I do to make your life uh, better and and one of the things again I say to, to my guys and every single person that wants to listen is that figure out the reason that you were put on this earth what was the reason that you were given the opportunity to live this life? And I think that uh, now more than ever, Harut, it's an opportunity for you to really show the kind of human you are uh, and not really think about how much, how, how can I take advantage? How can I make money? How could I, how could I expand my business? Uh, but really ask yourself, how can you help as many people uh, get out of this mess uh, as possible? And, 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 and try to give as much attention uh, to the people. And we talk about marketing and attention. And, and right now, attention is the most expensive space uh, that you can focus on. And Michelle, you know this more than anybody else does. Back in the day, uh, the, the rule of thumb on billboards, you've got three seconds, right? You've got three seconds to make an impression. 
And, and I used to go crazy when I used to see these billboards where you got paragraphs and I'm like, we got three seconds. Who the hell is going to read that within three seconds? Now we've got maybe half a second to make an impression. Uh, so stop trying to, uh, to put yourself out there through, you know, social channels or, or, or marketing. Try to, try to go directly to the person and just pick up the phone and say, how you doing? How is everything? What can I do? to make your life better. And I think as long as we all focus on that and really, really concentrate on just being better people, uh, I, I'm going to say this, I'm okay with the last three months. That's it. Thank, th thank you guys. Thank you, Harut. Um, yeah, I, I mean, look, there, there's, uh, there, there's a lot of, um, there, there's, a lot, there's a lot going on obviously in everybody's lives and everyone's families. Uh, but again, like I said, and like everyone has said uh, in, in this panel, um, you know, don't don't give up hope. Don't you know? Don't don't cave in. Um, you know, this is uh, this is a, a bump in the road. Yeah, maybe it's a uh, it's a bigger bump than usual. It's not your typical speed bump. Might be a little bit of a bigger bump, but you know, this too shall pass. Uh, and and I think. Um, you know, uh, like Harut said, you know, everyone here, and I know a lot of people, in my, I know my entire circle, our entire circle is always ready to help. Um, you know, there's no doubt that, um, you know, people are, are a lot more helpful nowadays. Yes, uh, you know, Harut mentioned, you're going to have some people taking advantage of the situation, but that, that's an, it's in every, uh, it's in every case, you know, every, every, every disaster, someone's going to uh, take advantage of, of, of something. Um, and, you know, that's not always, you know, it, it is what it is. That's the part of, uh, part of life, part of business. And, and um, you know, we, you can't help that. But, uh, you know, be good, be safe, um, you know, help each other out. Uh, you know, we're, we're not, you know, this, I, when we were talking uh, amongst us in the firm, uh, you know, there, there's a lot of things we can do. Again, you know, Michelle, Michelle knows, uh, Harut knows, Mel knows. Uh, already knows he sees everything we do that we can do a ton of things marketing wise. I mean, there's so many, so many things we can do to generate business. That's not, that's not the, that was not the purpose of this. This was, uh, you know, this was not a marketing pitch. This was not, this was strictly getting the right people uh, in this zoom room uh, to, to relay information uh, and, and to tell people that, look, you know, this is um, we are all in the same boat and we are all, uh, gonna fight and we are all going to um, survive this mess uh, and, and you know everyone here is uh, is confident of that uh, I have no doubt in, a, in anyone uh, here any of our followers any of our clients um, you know every everything everything will come to to a, to an end everything is going to come to a, a positive resolution you just got to believe that and you just gotta you know you got to work towards it it's not you know, there's, it's not, not, nothing, nothing comes for free. You know, we have to work hard. Everyone here works hard. I mean, during these, during these times, um, you know, like Hadud said earlier, they didn't fire anybody. Uh, you know, I know we didn't fire anybody. Uh, I know Michelle's been working. I know obviously Artie has been uh, working extra hard, but uh, you know, it's, 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 it's something where, um, you know, everyone, everyone is, uh, is working extra hard. And, and like Harut said, you know what, not that we, I guess, you know, we, we don't mind the last three months, but it, it, it creates a different, uh, it's created a different vibe. It's created a different uh, environment. It's created uh, stronger uh, people. It's created stronger businesses. Um, and, I, and I think uh, I'm, I'm very, very confident that, you know, this whole thing uh, is going to end up being better than it was before. Um, you know, the, n n none of this back to normal stuff, it's, it's going to be better. Uh, I, I believe in that. I know everyone here believes in that. And I know everyone will work towards that. So once again, guys, thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your time. I, I know we went for about an hour and 45 minutes and, and we can go for another hour, 45 easy. But like I said, I have commitments from you, uh, for, for, uh, you know, one-on-ones where we can, uh, get deeper into your, your respective areas. And um, we'll, we'll do that and we'll present that down the road. But again, thanks, we appreciate it. Thank you to all our um, followers and, and everyone who watched here and everyone who's gonna watch um, down uh, in, in the future. Uh, thank you everyone, be well, be safe. Uh, thank you and uh, God bless. Thanks, Otto. Thank you.
Thank you, Arut. Thanks, everyone. Already kick ass. <laughs>